always Kane Sims, and I am making the assumption that this is live. Last week, it uh, it took me three minutes or so to work out whether it was live, and in that process, people are just kind of watching me stumbling around in the dark, trying to push buttons and see whether things are live. So I'm trusting the process right now, boys and girls. Uh, welcome to VUX World uh, for the second podcast since my return, since having a wee little baby, and uh, yeah, the baby's doing fine. I'm lacking sleep, obviously, and so uh, Mark, if I do today veer off course or uh, start chatting absolute rubbish, more rubbish than normal, I think it's expected that I will chat some degree of rubbish, but uh, more than normal, then please do give me a prod, I'm probably lacking severe sleep right now. Um, but before we get into the, today's conversation with Mark Worden, and it's going to be an epic conversation indeed, because Mark presented at VUX at the EU Chatbot Summit in March in Edinburgh, and the topic area is absolutely fantastic. It is all around how uh, NatWest and Mark's team approach designing an accessible chat interface. Uh, it's WCAG compliant. It's, I think, the only chat interface that I've seen that is accessible. And really, the, the importance of this can't really be overstated. And no one's really given any airtime or even talking about accessibility, even though conversational AI, in theory, should be the most accessible interface on the planet because all you need to do to access it is talk, basically. But there are some fundamental limitations of many of these chat interfaces that do exclude people with certain accessibility needs, whether that could be blind, whether that's physical impairments. It could even be temporary uh, situations where you have accessibility needs, like, for example, you might break your arm. How do you then navigate and use your, your devices with, with uh, a broken arm and stuff like that? And so Mark and his team have put a whole load of effort into to building a completely accessible chat interface and we're going to get into that whole story and how it went down in just a moment but before we do that i need to tell you about two things one is the unpassed conference it's a it's an in-person conversation design conference the world's first it's full of world's first today world's first in-person conversation design conference happening in july july the 24th and 25th in london it's organized co-organized by video x world and lab works we are bringing the world's leading conversation design experts to london to share uh, essentially the best practice in this moving and changing world as it is uh, and so please do check that out if you're interested in attending you can save 50 percent on your tickets just go to unparsed conf and you can use the promo code VUX world to save 50 percent and we'll see you in london there's another event happening next week in london tuesday and wednesday reworks conversational ai summit I'll be there. I'm going to be hosting, uh, facilitating a panel or two, and I would love to see you there as well. You can go to rework, re-work.co forward slash events to find out more about that, 16th and 17th of May. Uh, so it's a busy, busy few weeks coming up, and uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, our guest for today, Mark Warden of NatWest. Nat Mark is the strategy and innovation lead at NatWest. A lot of experience in conversational AI, a lot of experience building and working on Cora, which we'll get into as well, and has led the team in producing uh, and building this accessible chat interface. So Mark, without further ado, welcome to VUX World, my friend. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you for for uh, spending some time with us. You're going to a different event next week, Generative AI Summit. Yes, yeah, going down to London for a couple of days. Uh, Chris from my team is actually speaking around some of the the research he's been doing into how we could effectively try and implement some form of generative AI in quite a heavily regulated industry. So, yeah. Mm. Nice. We'll get into some of that, hopefully. Uh, maybe at the back end of this conversation. I'm not asking you to give away Chris's talk, by the way, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've got some some perspectives on that. So it'll be nice to uh, nice to get into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank, thanks for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, maybe our paths will cross next week. Who knows? We will both be in the big smoke. And so, you know, maybe a whiskey or two can be uh, can be shared if the moment is right. Uh, <laughs> but aside from that, tell us tell us about yourself, Mark. Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, about your role. And also, I'm always interested in learning how people kind of get interested in AI in the first place. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been at NatWest for 10 years in February. Um, and I started in branch, actually. I was cashier. Um, so that's kind of how I I, I, I got into conversation AI. That's the weird thing to say. Um, but I, I worked in branch for four years, and then I was lucky enough uh, to move out of branch into, we have like an internal colleague FAQ system at the time. So our colleagues could say, how do I order a 
hard for a customer and depending on where they worked in the bank whether that was branch telephony web chat it would give them the answer um and that's actually how we how i started looking at conversational ai because that soon evolved into our own internal chatbot so i worked on that chatbot for a couple of years and then i moved across to the core so team call- about three and a half years ago so yeah i've been working on conversational ai in that west for about six years now um and more recently i'm as you mentioned strategy and innovation lead for chorus so my role and my team is is to look at kind of emerging technologies and new use cases for Cora and the strategy we have for Cora, and uh, to separate the hype from the reality and what works pass over to our delivery team to then inevitably put into Cora. nice so so you were on Cora from the beginning then not from the beginning, no. So around the time we started Ella, which was the the chat that I was working on, is around the time they started working on Cora. So I think in February it was Cora's sixth birthday. So uh, yeah, it's um, I've been on the journey for about three and a half of those years. Nice. And where was Cora when you kind of first got involved? Like, what was the state of it at that point? And what was it doing? And what was it kind of was it working well? Like, what can you describe to us, generally speaking, the lay of the land? from Cora's perspective when you joined? Yeah, it was uh, very much help and support, very much uh, simple kind of help journeys, doing what we could to try and remove some of the pressure on human colleagues. Um, We were just starting to look at automation in terms of what journeys could we do, what could we do from a transactional perspective for our customers. Um, And I don't think at that point we had any kind of tone of voice guidelines or anything like that. We were we were responding very much to the data from what customers were searching in Cora and trying to build those journeys very quickly. I joined in 2019, the back end of 2019. So quite shortly after that, COVID happened, um, which was then kind of an all hands on deck. Uh, I think uh, the team, the wider team managed to get our mortgage holiday and payment holiday journeys live within about 48 hours of the announcement from the government so it was it was a bit of a mad time looking back at it actually because it was all hands on deck people working long hours to try and get stuff out there because it was the most effective route for customers to join a queuing system to then come and and talk to us about those payment holiday breaks they needed from going on furlough and and being let go so it was an interesting time um and that's kind of the first few months of joining the team interesting so the payment holiday use case was that and in, in terms of its traction did that just naturally get it sounds like it was well used like did that just naturally get adopted was it were people pushed towards it like how did the how did that find its feet sort of thing i think i've lost you there mark don't know if uh there we go. There we go. Not there we go. Um, yeah, it, people were pushed towards it just because it was the most effective way of, of a queuing system at the time. You know, at some points, the queues were up to like 36 hours for an agent to respond. So it's not feasible to have someone on the phone waiting for that period of time. Whereas to give them the reassurance they're in the right place, we will get back to them. Uh, we, we had a huge surge in volumes as soon as the government announced those kind of schemes. So, yeah, it was definitely people were pushed towards that method. Um, but I, I think it was it was nearly half a million conversations that were handled and those payment holidays were dealt with. So it was wow. it was quite effective in, in getting customers to the right place pretty quick. Wow, that's very impressive. I've just noticed, is that Hogwarts behind you there? That is Hogwarts behind me, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is the, that's the dream, isn't it? That's the massive Lego, is it? Yeah, there's loads of different modular sets that have come together. Um, right. so, yeah, uh, that is what my that is that is what I'm all about. I'm very much into Lego these days, as with a four year old child, and I'm glad that he's into Lego because it's uh, yeah ideal. That is on the list. That one definitely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just caught it there. Um, so that that was a big accomplishment. Half a million users. That's fantastic. What are some of the other kind of from then till now obviously we're going to get on to the accessibility stuff uh, in a moment but what are some of the other sort of like milestones between then and now that you think were sort of like you know noteworthy for Cora in terms of your experience there 
Yeah, so I think like one of them for sure is is just the level of automation that we we've started putting into into Cora from our authenticated team. Yeah. So we like Cora can change your address, um, which is it was probably one of our biggest what we call process handoff journeys in that it had to have a human key the key yeah. request, um, and we've we've actually seen data recently where if a customer changes their address with a human, they're like 20% likely to call our telephone department to ask if it was done correctly the next day. If they change the address wow. with Cora, they're only 2% likely to do the same thing. So it's it's also nice to see those kind of, that kind of validation that actually by having Cora do that, then it's also helping the uh, kind of peace of mind with the customer as well. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd say that's definitely one of them. We, we've got quite a few journeys in the pipeline now where, uh, and, and in production where Cora can just complete the task for the customer. Um, and we've also implemented Cora into our IVR system as well. So we have a small team that works on it, but we, we've got a few journeys, transactional, some of them, some of them uh, are more help and support, but those journeys are being received really well. So when the customers are handed to Cora, um, they're, they're getting the right outcomes uh, for sure on that channel too. Nice. Sounds good. That's perfect. That's what you want, isn't it? Um, so, where did the where did the whole accessibility question come from then? So we'll get into the the solutions of that. But like going back, you know, over the last sort of like eighteen months or so, maybe it's longer. Where did this need arise from? What made you think? Mm, I think we need to have we need to be taking accessibility more seriously. So we had. Um as a bank so each channel so our e-banking platform mobile platform web platform uh, core as well we've all had like annual accessibility audits and in uh, a part of my role previous when i when i kind of first the first year i joined the core team i was the one who was liaising with our third parties on those accessibility defects and with our internal teams where it was stuff that we could change potentially copy was was incorrect things like that um so that was when I started to get a first awareness of kind of how many defects that we have uh, across our estate. Cause we also, we don't just cover Cora, we cover the help and support FAQs. So that was kind of the first moment where I really started to understand what accessibility was from a Cora perspective um, and what we could start to do to really kind of help our customers. Um, we also then, uh began a, a monthly accessibility forum where each of those channels come together because ultimately we're all making the same mistakes so our mobile team would be making a very similar mistake that we've made in the past or or we might make a mistake that our e-banking team have made so we started that forum to to kind of collaborate and share our learnings and and what we'd understood from the findings of those audits and how we were then uh looking to fix them and that was kind of the beginning, really. We we have an incredible one bank accessibility lead now in Bex who who led that forum and and is probably one of the most passionate people I've ever met <laughs> talking about accessibility. Um, and yeah, it kind of started from there. And and we have a an enable network internally who who did a roundtable with four customers with various access needs. So they spent an hour with, with those customers and talking about their channel preferences. So it wasn't specific to chatbots, wasn't specific to, to e-banking or, or the mobile app, but it was just more banking in general. How do they access it and how do they prefer to interact? And some people with with some defects were saying that, that they um, absolutely preferred not to speak to a human face-to-face. That's, that's how they prefer to do their banking, which is very much where we can help with that scenario. Um, I know there's it was more a physical disability where actually it was it was quite difficult for them to get into a branch and, and they preferred to do their banking more digitally. So that was quite an eye opener. I think there was one 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 of the women on the call said something along the lines of, you know, I've tried to do this before and it didn't work, but it's probably my fault. And I remember sat, sitting there watching it thinking it's absolutely not your fault. That's how that's been designed. That's our fault for the way that we've designed that um and i don't know that kind of really hit home with me and and then we had the opportunity arise where we could where we were looking at do we actually build our own chat user interface and that was absolutely one of 
one of the selling points for me was hang on we could if we if we have full control over this we could design this in a way where anyone can use this and not have an issue mm, yeah it's interesting isn't it like the it's quite a common theme that the the whole sort of like users blaming themselves i remember i did a lot of work with government in the past and one of the things that we used to always do as a mandatory sort of activity was any new project that we took on we would do usability testing on the existing service and then when we did a redesign we would then do usability testing on the redesign service and so we could compare and contrast and one of the things that was always the case was that when people make mistakes they would well I'd say mistake when people couldn't accomplish a task they always blamed themselves all the time and the fact of the matter was like the websites are so poorly designed the information architecture is all over the place there's so much jargon put around all over sometimes the information that people need isn't actually available on the website at all anyway and people are like oh it's probably just me because i can't find it you know like, people have a knack for blaming themselves all the time don't they which is yeah it's mad yeah <clears throat> is it uh was this a because it was as i said with government in the past <clears throat> excuse me it was it was kind of like a government mandate essentially which said all government websites from i think might have been the date might have been 2018 like july 2018 or something like that by that point had to be wacag 2.0 compliant and then there was just like a massive initiative like all government bodies central local everyone was working on making their websites accessible was that a similar sort of situation with you or was this just coming from from elsewhere in natwest and someone said you know the right thing to do is to make things accessible or was it driven by kind of a legislation initiative or something like that it was more driven kind of from from bex brinley in terms of she she's well she she now is the the one bank accessibility lead to the bank and with the accessibility forum that we have on all the kind of digital channels and the digital estate with this forum we, we're kind of making that commitment that everything we design is designed with accessibility in mind mm -hmm. and whilst we're doing that design because there's a number of those platforms that are going through uh, migrations to, to new designs um we also want to make sure that we're also actively going back and fixing what is in our capacity to fix um so that we can try and become the an accessible bank by design that's the kind of tagline of of, of what we're going for and um I think it's been really like drive and you know bex has, has taken presentations up to, to the top of the bank and and got sign off that this is absolutely the direction we want to go in as well so there's just been a real focus on it over the last 12 18 months and i think that push has really sort of helped because we're almost that community of different banking channels and we're trying to learn from each other and and reuse what we do in one channel and another place it's just almost uh, just created that that community kind of drive within and that culture within that West, which has been great to see. Mm, nice. And the you mentioned there, you know, to, to to create something yourself ultimately gives you more control, and you can do kind of what you want with it. What are then some of the limitations that people will find from an accessibility perspective with some of their current chat bots for example you might go to dialogue floor today you can create a chat bot you can deploy it on a website there's a chat interface there you know you can use any other platform name one they all come with a front end that you deploy on your website and i think the general consensus amongst people who aren't aware is that it does the job it goes it's live it allows people to talk to it you know it, it kind of does what it needs to do maybe some limitations around how you can make it look and feel in design wise and stuff like that but I think there's just a gap in terms of from, certainly from an accessibility perspective in terms of where some of those limitations might be. So I wonder whether you could share what some of those gaps are. Like what were you finding from your current provider that just wasn't wasn't kind of where it needed to be? Yeah, there was a few things from from the audit that we we had where we saw some common themes. One of them was tables. Um, so displaying information in a table, our, our provider didn't have that as a as a piece of what we would call structured content that we could use so it was it was almost created a little bit hacky in behind the scenes so it was actually a collection of buttons is the way our tables were built mm. but because of that from an accessibility perspective when a screen reader was then trying to read it it was just announcing button left right and center didn't tell the user it was a table the, the things that were clickable weren't announced as clickable it was it was a whole nightmare, to be honest, in terms of tables. Um, 
and and that kind of brings me on to just ui components in general carousels are a bit of a nightmare if they're not set up correctly from a uh, from a, an accessibility perspective um some of the issues we saw was that the buttons were embedded within the cards so they were hard to see on mobile devices there were no buttons so you could only swipe and that's and that that, that is an accessibility defect because some people struggle with the swipe gestures mm-hmm. um and it was it, there's there's a lot of focus around uh, it's called the focus uh, focus area so anything that's interactive should have a box around it if you tab on any website you'll start to see the box moving around and that's to highlight any interactive elements to people with a screen reader quite often on chatbots they'll either be too many of those in places where they shouldn't be or they're not in the places they should be which can then confuse someone with a visual impairment um and aside from those kind of things with the UI, obvious color contrast as well is probably the main one. If you are customizing your own look and feel to those kind of chatbots and you're putting your own colors on there, absolutely run it through a color contrast checker because that's something that a lot of people will put to one side and forget. And actually it's a super simple thing to fix from an accessibility standpoint, just making sure your colors contrast in the right way. Uh, but from a, from a conversation design as well, from that perspective, you know, if you have too many ter- too many uh, chat bubbles in one turn of a conversation, or too many uh, options in one turn of a conversation, so you might be like, "Oh, click this link, click this link. Here's a video. Here's this," and before you know it, you you're just causing cognitive overload for for you because for all customers, let alone people from the neuro neurodiverse community as well. So. There's, there's a lot of different things that we learned. There were some things that were in our control, which is more the latter of the conversation design, and, and we've gone ahead and implemented those principles. But there's certainly a lot from a UI perspective that, that you just won't even consider in terms of how they work. Um, mm. we, we always find as well that if when, when we build something for, for NatWest Chat or when we've tested stuff for uh, our previous provider, you need to make sure you test on a variety of devices because what works absolutely fine for Chrome, for uh, Edge, for Windows, for Androids might not work fine for some uh, for Safari, and vice versa. Something might work absolutely fine on Safari or using iOS's in-app accessibility settings, but doesn't for Android for whatever reason. So it's about just having that wide variety of devices because customers will as well so Mm -hmm. we want to make sure that what whatever we're designing works kind of across that kind of landscape of devices that can be used yeah absolutely um it's interesting you mentioned uh color contrast the uh i remember the first blog of mine in probably 20 probably 2012 or so i had a in fact, I won't. I wouldn't encourage you to go there now because what happened is my domain expired. Kanesims dot com expired. Now someone's got all of it turned it into this. Uh, I don't know Chinese advertising landing page, and further down there is some extremely uh, you know not safe for work stuff in there. And so, so I'm on this quest to try and get my domain name back. Uh, but anyway, the very first version of that of that blog, I thought it was really cool to use orange text. <clears throat> orange text white background looks really super cool and it was going for about a, about a year 12 months or so until someone messaged me on twitter one day and said um by the way i just thought i'd tell you that your website is an absolute nightmare for me and i was like why is that he said well i'm colorblind mm. and i don't know i can't i can barely read the text so i think they had like red colorblindness and because i was using uh orange text it basically just the whole page just looked like really faint words and that was the first time i'd ever kind of been exposed to someone with an accessibility requirement using something that i'd created and i just felt terrible because i was like I've, this has been like this for like 12 months and I, th- and I think when i when i was working in, in some accessibility stuff uh again in in, in government the research was out there was saying that something to something to the tune of between nine and twelve percent of the population have some kind of color blindness. Yeah. So it's like just, just color contrast on its own can potentially be exclusive for like up to ten up to twelve percent of of your people, which is you wouldn't even think of it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's stuff. It's even simple stuff as well. So those boxes I mentioned, the focus area. Um, if depending on the color of your website will then dictate what color you'll need to use for that because if if that 
doesn't pass color contrast with all the different areas of your website then it's great that you've got the focus area that's fantastic for people with the screen reader but for people with that visual impairment and the screen reader they can't see where it is so yeah mm. it's um it's an easy one to miss but also an easy one to fix yeah and how did you go about finding as you mentioned there you know using multiple sort of like you know, conversational bubbles for want of a better phrase, you know, multiple kind of responses and having videos and all these kind of things in a single response. I mean, it's 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 obvious for a designer to look at something and say, that's too much, you know, especially if, if at any point the text goes above the fold, so it's hidden, you've got to scroll back up to see it, you're definitely in dicey territory. So there's, there's an argument there, which is that it's good practice anyway to keep things concise. But when you mentioned there that, that certain people with certain accessibility needs, there is that sort of like cognitive overload. How did you go about identifying that? Because it seems as though the audit that you did or can do, there's, there's tools out there that can scrape a website and just assess whether it's WCAG compliant based on things like those focus areas and color contrast and that sort of stuff. But to get that kind of like qualitative feedback from the end user that says actually that's too much. How, did you do anything in terms of that qualitative exploration to tr with people with accessibility needs to try and determine those kind of limitations yeah so we <clears throat> we have an, an internal team that does accessibility team for us um so we always get them to run through our accessibility testing if we're developing any kind of new component or uh, if we're using a component in a way we haven't used before we'll always make sure that before it's released we'll we'll get that team to test and in the past we have had um there are there have been people in that team who have got access needs um and i actually find that as weird as it's going to sound the most interesting people to test our products because I think the first time we designed for focus areas, for example, we threw them everywhere. We were like, well, we want to announce everything. Every time you tab, we want everything to be announced to the screen reader. And um, the gentleman who came back and he he ran through all of our all of our tickets with our UI dev team in India and with myself and, and some of the people on the project from the UK. And it was just sitting down with him and understanding why that was an issue for him in particular and how much easier it is for him to use the product by reducing it to just the interactive elements and almost understanding the reasoning and not just, here's a huge document of workout guidelines, go through them, read them, and just see if it works. Um, it, it was just useful to get his understanding and, and his experience, really. And I think for one of, one of the, one of the uh, experiences that, that stands with me is, when I was working on the internal facing chatbot on the other team, we were doing a pilot to expand to a new business area. And there was a gentleman who had a visual impairment. And it was the first time we'd come up against, uh, like, making sure that, that things were accessible from that perspective. And I spent an hour shadowing him. And he had the customer in one ear on the phone. He worked on the phones. And he had his screen reader in the other ear. And the speed at which that screen reader read was just astonishing. Like, I don't know how on earth he kept up with what the customer was saying at the same time as this screen reader was saying in the other ear and, and also talking to the customer. And But like, it, it was like a magician, honest to God. Um, and it, I think it's just by having someone who who has the issue with the product in the first place explain why it's an issue is the easiest way to start to then understand what you should be doing going forwards if that makes sense yeah. absolutely yeah 100 percent. i mean i've had this conversation a number of times on, on the podcast i think the last time we was with michael coppins with the, the the concept of kind of user-centric design and pe people i think the conversation i had with michael was have we forgotten everything that we've learned basically which is that in software design in user experience design in any form of product design really if you're designing in a user-centric way you're at least if you're not involving users directly in the creation and design you're at the very least putting it in front of those people during the process mm -hmm. so that you get an actual feedback and you're responding to the real needs of real users and it's just amazing how Fair enough. On the one hand, on the one hand, you could say that conversational AI is more of a technical kind of um, 
you know, to, to, to create a really robust conversational AI, it requires a whole load of technical skills. There's no doubt about that. But I think what ends up happening is that the, the companies and, and businesses lean into the technical aspects of it because they view it as a technical project. And even though we bring designers into the situation and into the mix, for, for many coming into conversation design, they might be coming into conversation design from writing there might be a playwriter or a co co content designer or something like that you know which is great because you need multiple perspectives and multiple skills but there just seems to me at least in my experience over the last kind of half decade that there's a little bit of an absence of some of the typical ux design practices that should be part of every single project that's created any product that touches a customer should involve those customers at the very least from a testing capacity so i think what you're describing there is exactly what you know you should do and especially when it comes to accessibility because you there's no way at all of being able to figure out whether or not you're doing the right thing unless you can put it in pe in front of people with those needs isn't it absolutely absolutely and for me as well is <clears throat> we have people on the team who have various access needs and they, they range from people in neurodiverse community to uh, people with physical access needs and i think just by having that inclusive kind of workforce too like that's one of the things i i enjoy the most about working here is that we do have a diverse team of people that that bring themselves to work and and you can almost call on them just to keep you in the right place as well um mm. as you mentioned when we were speaking at the conference it, it came up you know there's four white men on on the on the panel talking about accessibility and it, <clears throat> i do think it's important in making sure that you do have that diversity across the team and at the very least in the people who you're testing with yeah absolutely um without a doubt the um oh, what was i was going to say there i've lost my train of thought now i'm sure it was incredibly uh invigorating and exciting but you're right <laughs> you're right though you know you have to actually get it in front of in front of the uh in front of the right people because that's the only way you're ever going to find out whether it whether it works oh yeah that, that was what i was going to ask you mentioned you mentioned it a couple of times now uh neurodiversity in that because I've never come across that term before. In, in within that kind of category, are we talking things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, those kind of things? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Just wanted to clarify. Um, okay, so that sounds good. So, so I think we've been through the process of um, the 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 requirement to be more accessible emerged through conducting various audits, various assessments, putting together a working group realizing through an audit that the tools that you are using currently don't particularly work uh, greatly effectively and then the decision was made to kind of redesign the the interface it's uh, and, and then we've kind of gone through the process of of doing that and and the learnings in terms of things like color contrast and, and your learnings with carousels and, and screen readers and stuff like that including uh, the target user group as part of that process was there anything that we haven't covered during that process to get to where it is today that you think is important for anybody who is wanting to do something similar and make their their conversational AI more accessible? Yeah, so so one of the things that we have included um, in that West chat, which is the name for the, the interface for Cora that, that we've uh, put out there for one of our brands at the moment, is the ability to change Cora's tech speed. And that was actually quite a, a big defect. It was a blocker that we had with our existing supplier in that if Cora was to deliver more than one chat bubble like to the to the customer, what it would do with the screen reader is it would start reading the first one. And then when it got partway through and the next one was delivered, it would stop and then start reading the second one. And yeah, there's a workaround. Customers can tap back up and they can rehear the, the uh, bubbles at their own pace but it's not a great experience in the first instance in that we're just interrupting halfway through a sentence basically, and then reading the second sentence. So we've given the ability for customers to change core speed. And what that means is they can slow it right down if they're on a screen reader. And the reason we did that is because NatWest has an initiative called Banking My Way. So anyone can go onto Banking My Way, they can register um, any kind of, um, what's the word i'm looking for any uh, changes that they may need um based on the scenario it can be anything from um a family member just passed away so they might need support with that or it could be something which the most one of the most common ones we looked at at the time was you need to speak slower to me and that was 
definitely more aimed at our branch and telephony staff so they can see that there's this marker on on the person's account when they register and they can go right i need to speak slowly to this customer but we really took that to heart with Cora because actually it's it's the same thing Cora's having the conversation. So we we added in that ability. Right now it's very manual. You'll have to go in and you have to change it. But we do have plans further down the line to actually take that data from Banking My Way and go, this customer's already told us this, so we're going to automatically slow Cora down. Um, and then if they do speed it up, then we'll we'll remember the latest setting that they've set it to. But that's that's kind of one step that we've done which is an enhancement on what we originally had um i always make the joke we can't do that with agents can't control how fast <laughs> their agents speak but for cora we can so we absolutely should and, and do with with natwest chat um we are looking at further enhancements down the line along those veins almost an accessibility features uh, panel where we could increase the tech speed decrease the tech speed those kind of things too but we felt it was really important to to get that in for the for the first delivery, um, mm. and yeah, it's um, our, our conversation analysts are very happy with it anyway because when they're testing through the conversations, they can speak core up, and it's always the opposite effect. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I mean, I I have noticed myself over the last kind of like probably I don't know a couple of years listening to more podcasts and even now so I'll, I'll speed up the podcasts really to usually like one and a half times the speed or if it's like a long podcast that i want to get through i'll put it on like two times the speed same with audio books i'll at least have them on like 1.5 but what i've also noticed now is that with some youtube videos i'll do the same and i'll actually go through the pain of going into the youtube settings and speeding it up which i don't know it's mad like because i so it's not, this is kind of eventually getting around to, again, some of the conversations that we had in, in Edinburgh, which is that when you design for accessibility and you do things like allow for the, the playback speeds to be increased or decreased, when you do things like you make clickable elements bigger so that you can tap them quite easily on a thumb on mobile when you do things like make the language plain english and you strip away all your jargon and when you do things like make, make sure that the color co colors have significant significant contrast you're not just designing for accessibility you're designing actually for everybody because it makes things better for everyone doesn't it yeah absolutely uh, i think i was <laughs> i was playing god of war uh ragnarok um just before christmas and i remember going on reddit and seeing the sheer amount of accessibility features that they included in that game there was a, a large large community of people who didn't have access needs but were taking advantage of the things that those accessibility features did um i know i've been on a few of them myself and it just made the game easy to play um mm. and yeah it's, it's exactly that point if you're designing for people even with as, as we kind of talked in, in edinburgh temporary or situational access needs so maybe they've just had a baby like yourself they've got a child in one arm so they only have one arm free or they've broken their arm or they've lost their arm so you cover that spectrum by designing for the people with the temporary access needs you are completely designing for everyone across the board yeah absolutely um i'll tell you a good are you are you an apple person or android person android i recently made the switch are you Interesting. Well, Android, I'm, I'm assuming they'll have the same features. But one of the things that I've come across recently, which I think is fantastic, is uh, I've added into my shortcuts now. So if I, at night time, when it gets to probably about, I don't know, eight o'clock or so, it's not automated yet. It should really be automated. I don't think I can set that up. But basically, I'll just click. I've got this little accessibility shortcut down here. I don't know if people can see. I click that, and then the color filters come on. Click on color filters, and everything turns black and white. And so I'd get rid of all the colors. <clears throat> and what that does is basically rather than everything being when I, when I open my phone, everything's like mad colors and there's red dots on all, on all of the sort of apps and stuff like that. It just basically just nullifies your phone. So you don't really feel like it's surprising how much colors, what colors can do. Like when you just look at your, your phone's home screen, the colors get drawn in. And all of a sudden you find yourself in an app. You know what I mean? So I, I put it on black and white every night so I don't get distracted. Um, but that's an accessibility feature. That's not necessarily for that purpose, but having that feature available makes it better for everybody, you know? Absolutely, yeah. No, It's, it's, it's amazing uh, what just changing mad. the colours can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mad, it's mad. Uh, that's, 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 that is fantastic, generally. Um, and as I said before, when, when we were speaking at uh, in Edinburgh, was that, you know, the, the lengths that you've gone to do this, I think, is great. 
and I hope that this conversation and those that are tuning into it kind of take notice of the importance of that. Like there's, there's a really good thing. I can't, I forget the lady's name now. Um, there's a really good content designer. I'll find out the name and I'll, I'll put her link in the show notes. Um, she used to work for GDS and round about the time when I was doing a lot of this work around accessibility for government services and stuff like that, um, the the central government were publishing a lot of guidance around things like content design and one of the things that uh that, that they used to say is that dumbing it down is opening it up because a lot of people that you speak to i'm sure you've probably had similar situations like that west where you'll speak to certainly people that work in certain departments and certain teams and they're just wrapped up in the knowledge you know and they need to be wrapped up in that knowledge because that's their job but yeah. that knowledge and that that language surfaces on the front end of your website and your app if you're not careful and those people think that if you're just going to take out all the terminology shorten all the sentences down then you're just going to dumb the content down but the whole concept is that when you do that and if you do dumb it down, you then open it up to be accessed and, and understood by everybody rather than the people that understand big words, you know. And I think like working in working in a bank, I think we absolutely do get wrapped up in that sometimes. You know, we'll have conversations and if there's one thing that West loves, it's an acronym, right? So internally, like we'll just have acronyms for everything. And I feel bad for like even new starters, right? So not even talking about customers here, just people joining the team, because we'll often say like all these acronyms in one sentence. And then like I'll almost then have to stop and think, hang on, does that person know all those acronyms? They've only just joined. Um, but I think we are quite guilty of it as a bank. And I, and I think, you know, that can sometimes bleed itself into journeys that we create, right? Because we're so wrapped up in this kind of financial world that we can often assume other people have the similar level of knowledge to us. And I think I, I read this fact or I get told this fact quite a number of times and I don't know what exactly the right number is. It's, it's somewhere always between nine and 12, but the average reading age for, for the UK, I'll hear it's nine or it's 12 or it's 10. Mm. It's not high and actually financial terminology isn't the easiest thing to ingest uh so i think there is a lot of things that especially to that point of if you dumb it down it makes it easier for everyone absolutely especially when it comes to finances and and we're in this weirdly unique position where a customer could potentially be with us their entire life right so they yeah. join with us with a, a child account and it naturally just grows up with them until they're planning for life after work and to be with a customer on that kind of journey talking about all the different complexities throughout each life stage in a simple way <laughs> to help coach them through it i think that's that's quite a skill that it's definitely something that we're looking at more in terms of how can we become more accessible for that sort of financial guidance i'm not going to use the word guidance but yeah, <laughs> yeah. well that's, that's the case though isn't it because like the financial literacy in general you know from a populist perspective is lacking mm -hmm. and a lot of banks are, are, are adopting that position now which is yes obviously the typical banking stuff you'll always be able to do your money will be safe with those kind of thing but at the same time it's helping people do things like save for retirement helping people do things like save to to buy a house or whatever making sure that people get the right kind of mortgage based on their situation or whatever it might be so a lot of banks are kind of moving more into that sort of like you know you know the guidance the advisory sort of position to help people you know with their whatever their situation is and you can't really do that unless you speak the same language as them yeah. and unless you have your things and your services available where they need them, when they need them kind of thing. So it's, it's, I suppose everything we've been talking about from a, not just an accessibility perspective, but I, th I suppose how it fits into the wider NatWest kind of strategy is I imagine opening up your resources, your information and your services to as wider demographic uh, as you possibly can so that you have more chance of being, you know, being there from childhood to, to retirement or, or what have you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's really important with that sort of tone of voice and the language that we use because the last thing we want to do is frustrate a customer, create that friction point, and for them to then choose a different channel to ask that question, which may not be as convenient to them as just simply loading up core and asking a question. So yeah, it's it's vitally important that we we get that right and that we make sure that 
the direction we're going in. We, as you say, I'll say it again, just design with those accessibility needs in mind because it will help to design for all, like from a content perspective, from a copy perspective, from a UI perspective. It just helps across the board. Mm, absolutely. Um, wicked. So I can't let you go without asking a few questions about uh, what you might expect to be spoke about on, a, on an AI-focused podcast, which is uh, the... the <laughs> The generative AI, AI movement. Uh, I don't know if you saw Google I.O. I haven't actually saw it myself yet because I've been extremely busy today and last night. Um, but I did see a very, uh, a really good clip with Google CEO and it was someone on LinkedIn shared uh, something like startup capital or startup funds are really difficult to raise these days. So take a lesson from Google CEO and use this kind of stuff in your pitch. And the whole video was just his keynote chopped out every single time he mentioned ai was just like thrown back together so the whole video is just sundar going ai 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 we're looking on we're working on ai deep learning ai ai and it's just the whole thing is so funny so obviously there's been a lot of things announced but i haven't seen it yet i don't know if you've saw it i don't know what your thoughts are generally on uh, on one is google open ai those big players providing these foundation sort of models and then also how that might apply to some of the stuff they are doing with with cora yeah, I've not, I've not seen it myself personally, but I, it's it's really interesting in terms of the scope of what we could start to achieve. Um, the the difficulty is the obvious things that everyone talks about um, in terms of the reliability, the ethics, the the hallucinations, and and the last thing we want to do is in any way implement anything that would start to give our customers wrong information especially when it's to do with people's finances that's one of the most important things to people if not the most important thing to people so we are starting to have a look at how we could do that in a safe way and we are starting to look at the use cases that we would have that we would want for Cora. we're, we're fortunate in that we have a few internal uh conversational assistance so there are things we can do in that kind of test bed and work with those partners um to understand how they're using these kind of new technologies and implementing them and how safe they are um what are the things we're starting to look at at the moment is how do we actually use our own content on the websites so if a customer has a conversation with Cora, we don't have an intent for that conversation and it's going to go to our fallback, then can we actually use generative AI to look at our web pages, our own web pages, and then summarize that part of the web page and deliver it to the customer? So there, there are things that we're starting to look at and there's potentially more exciting things on the horizon. Um, in terms of, yeah, so that's from from a kind of generative AI perspective. In terms of from like an accessibility perspective, we are looking at our natural conversation framework. We're very keen to start looking at voice. Um, and as part of that, we're starting to play around with how do we make sure our journeys are designed voice first? Because they absolutely aren't right now. Our journeys have been evolving over the last six years from the first inception of Cora and definitely voice wasn't the thing that was at the front of our, of our minds back then. Um, but equally, start to have a think around, can we actually, if, if we are starting to look at our websites in terms of helping with those small scale answers that, that we don't have the capacity to build, um, does it also then make sense to start thinking about potentially changing the the level of understanding that a customer would require to read it so you know if a customer does have a lower financial capacity or capability then do we actually display our answers in a different way if we know they have a specific vulnerability do we display answers in a specific way as well so that there are things like that that we're starting to think about and actually the conversation framework helps with that because when you talk about voice customers might want well, first of all, they might not hear, so they might just ask for Cora to repeat. Right now, Cora doesn't have that capability, uh, but with this framework, she would. Um, and equally, if if a customer didn't understand something, they could ask Cora to explain, which would then give that almost 
as we were speaking before, sort of dumbed down version of what she's just said. So it would help with that. Um, so yeah, there's there's a few different things we're looking at from kind of a generative AI and and accessibility perspective yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Nice. What's the natural conversation framework? So this is this is our fancy name uh, for looking at how can we set in a framework in place where we design journeys voice first. So voice is a huge direction forwards for us from an accessibility perspective. And by actually making our conversations more conversational, so less reliant on a logic tree with buttons, which is, is what we're quite reliant on now, then the theory is that we could actually apply a voice to digital Cora and mm -hmm. that extra feature from an accessibility perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also means that we wouldn't potentially be designing one variation of a journey for our digital Cora, so Web, banking, mobile, and a separate one for Cora and IVR, because in theory, it should be interchangeable. They should work. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I think you'll definitely find um, the challenges of voice being different. Like you mentioned there, the the like button based chip suggestion stuff you know with chat you can fall back on videos and carousels and images and tables and stuff whereas in voice reading a table back through a voice interface is pretty much impossible uh and so it's 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 definitely different you've got a lot more the immediacy is more prevalent with voice so you, you've definitely got to respond in real time whereas chat people can pause reread the sentence scroll up see what came before it whereas voice is ephemeral and once it's gone it's gone sort of thing so there's definitely more like it's not really conversation repair people will call it conversation repair but it's not really it's just the nature of voice which is that yes you'll get more people asking for clarification and asking follow-up questions like you know why do you need that information or what you're going to do with that and you know things that you might not expect in chat because you've got guardrails and you're giving suggestions and almost like pushing people into a certain space with voice it's uh the the general architecture needs to be a lot more robust because it can go can go anywhere you know um and then you've got the speech to text to worry about in the first place you know <laughs> is that accurate uh are you feeding rubbish into the nlu in the first instance and so how can you sort of like you know get that more robust and stuff like that so it's definitely an interesting challenge but for me that that's like voice is conversation design you know the the a lot of what some would consider conversation design it, it, i wouldn't necessarily think so it's more i say business process design really if you if you, if if it's start here three options lead to these three things <laughs> at this th at this first thing it can go down here and that more kind of like keyword based stuff it's more like a business process that you're building yeah you're not really whereas with voice you've got the effect essentially the equivalent of a mini business process at every single turn of the conversation <laughs> and then more so because the clarifications and further questions and so on so it gets yeah, it can be very, it can be quite complex, but I think that the, the approach of designing voice first is the right one, because if you can nail the conversation itself without guardrails and without buttons and ch suggestion chips and without all that kind of stuff, if you can get a conversation pattern working in voice, then you're right, that'll apply anywhere. And it'll be robust as you like in every other channel, because uh, you've got a lot more guardrails in those other channels. And so, yeah, if you get voice working well, then you're, that's what I call pure conversation design. Yeah, absolutely nice cool that's wicked well mark thank you so much for uh for joining me it's been uh fantastic I, I, as i said before i genuinely think that the this work in accessibility is one is groundbreaking actually you know it feels it feels kind of like wrong to say that accessible design is groundbreaking because <laughs> it shouldn't be needed to be seen that way because it should just be as you said accessible by design but as we've said, and as we've discussed, you know, um, not all uh, companies work in that way, which is a shame. But I think that the work that you're doing and where you have Cora now and where you've got NatWest Chat now, I think is a perfect example for, for everyone else to follow. And I think that the fact that this innovation is coming from a, an enterprise rather than the vendors, I think is one, I suppose it's symptomatic of the fact that you're closer to the customer anyway. Um, but two, I think it should be a lesson to all those vendors listening, which is that going forward large enterprises i think are going to start asking questions about accessibility and so everyone i think needs to start building their stuff with accessibility in mind definitely and i think it's uh it's thanks to thanks to you and conversations like this that, that things like that can happen so thank you for thank you for joining me no worries it's been a pleasure 
Thank you all for tuning in as well. Uh, what's going on next week? I, I will give you what's happening next week. I don't exactly know who got on the podcast next week, which is which is really bad of me. Let me just see if I can go and try and find that out. Oh, actually, it's Core AI, actually. Yes, we're going to have Gopi from Core AI. Uh, and we're going to be talking about... Uh, go, uh, we're going to be talking about AI in retail. So any retailers out there that are interested in how conversational AI, generative AI, large language models are reshaping the future of retail then uh, definitely tune in. This one's going to be interesting because it's not just about conversational AI on the front end. It's also how do you integrate that with back-end systems and processes and employee experiences to make the entire end-to-end retail journey more streamlined. So please do join me for that. And if I don't see you then, I hopefully might see you next week at Rework's Conversational AI Summit. Uh, And so all the best. Thank you so much. And we'll see you.